Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host. Well, Chris Brown, got to keep on saying my name. Good PR for myself. Uh, today, I am honored and pleased to have our guest, actor, comedian, podcast host, pastry, or not pastry, pasta chef. Don't uh, call me an actor. <laughs> hey. I can't act. <laughs> Mr. Jeb Fink. Jeb. Thank you so much for doing this. Thanks. I can't even act nice. You know what I like to be nice to people sometimes. I just can't. Even when it's easier to be really, really nice to someone because you know they'll go away. I, yeah, I don't have it in me sometimes. So you're not truly a Canadian then, because Canadians have no. that repertoire uh, repertoire of being nice. Yeah, I don't. I don't know why that is. I mean, there's got to be some mean Canadians out there, but. I'm, ass I'm assuming you've seen a few in your time as a comedian uh, up on stage, probably being heckled. I, when I first came up here, I had uh, some that didn't like me because I was from the States. But, you know, once you get to about the 30-year mark of living somewhere, you're, you're not an American anymore. You're, you're a Canadian. So do you consider yourself Canadian? Pretty well, yeah. Yeah, I, don't, I have no interest in going back to the States. I have kids and grandkids down there. They're going to need to come up and see me. Uh, I usually start off with one question, but it seems like we're already in Go the middle of the question. The, the question that I want to pose to you is, what is comedy to you? You know, that's a bizarre question. <laughs> what is comedy to me? Um, I asked it to Mary Walsh, and she had an answer, so that's why I want to ask it to you as well. Oh, yeah, um, comedy to me, it's more about what makes me laugh than what makes the audience laugh. I mean, I know how to construct comedy for an audience that would not necessarily be things that I find the funniest thing on earth. But actually, February 3rd through the 5th, I'm the Bla at the Blackfoot Inn. And uh, if you buy tickets to that show, I do what I want. I'm not there to make you happy. I mean, it is funny, but sometimes you got to have a bit of a sick sense of humor, which is okay. Is it? Is it okay to have a sick sense of humor in uh, comedy in 2022 when? I don't care. I. You know what? If you don't, if you don't like what you're hearing, you know. You don't have to buy the ticket. <laughs> get get up and. And uh, can we cuss on this show? You certainly can. All right, can. You get up and fuck off. Like it's so, and it's okay to find something I say offensive. I'm okay with that, and I love it when people stay till the end of the show to come and tell me they were offended, and I'll say, well, thanks for spending the time and buying a ticket and coming to see me. What? Why did you wait? Like, did you think I was gonna give a shit? What was Mary Walsh's answer? Her answer was... Uh, I'm just trying to remember because this was back in February of last year. Her answer was along the lines of comedy is something that you find uh, intriguing and you can tell a story about. Did she include the phrase, in my personal opinion, anywhere? Yes. <laughs> oh, good for her. Good. Okay, I will allow that answer then. <laughs> Because every, everything that you you say is in your opinion, and in my opinion, I do story humor. I don't um, do set up punchline, set up punchline, and uh, I find the humor in the story, and um, I also find the humor in pain. Uh, a lot of the, of the time, it's my own pain. You know, I went through a um, oral surgery this year, and it was. Um, and I will say, I have, I have steel rods in my back from breaking my back, and the oral surgery was the worst thing I've gone through. Wow. It was just brutal. But I have 20 minutes of comedy about it. Well, and I find that interesting because in 2020, I was diagnosed with cancer. Okay. Tumor, tumor on my occipital lobe and my uh, temporal lobe. So if I forget your name during the interview, that's why. Um, I joked about it. I don't. I I think you just forget names and you're <laughs> using it as an excuse. That too, probably. But I joked about it, and people were offended by the fact that I was joking about something so serious. It's for you. Yeah. You know, I have stuff of my dad died of cancer, and I have uh, I have stuff about him that, honestly, if you're the one with the cancer or 
Uh, which is at one point they finally told me, well, we thought you had a bone cancer in your jaw. Anyway, if you're the one that's going through it, uh, who cares what anybody else thinks? And it shouldn't be their opinion. And uh, you should be allowed to talk about it. You own it. It's yours. Like, that's how I feel about it. And uh, I did. I got a bit about when my dad died of cancer. I went to see him, and he was he was pretty far gone. He couldn't even get out of bed anymore. And I, you know, he was trying to get up. And I said, "What are you doing?" He said, um, I, I, "We got to get up. We're going hunting." I said, "We we can't go hunting, Dad." And he said, "Why not?" And I said, "Well, you can't walk." And he goes, "Well, fuck me," and laid down. And I thought, you know what? I, that was funny. It was just that, uh, well, he had in his head, he was ready to go hunting, which he loved to do. And uh, then I was like, oh, yeah, shit, I forgot I have cancer. And, you know, if you can't laugh at every situation, I feel bad for you. I understand if you can't. But if you're so serious in your life, you can't pick up little tidbits of, of funny uh, to laugh your way through it. I mean, my entire family, we get through everything shitty with comedy, you know, with laughing. Did Where did your comedy chops come from? Was it something you just always had? Was oh. just like, where did your co- drive to do comedy come from? Because getting up on stage that first time, I, I know people who have gone through, try to That's be brutal. stand. Exactly. And to be to do it over and over again and be where you are now as a sort of Canadian legend of comedy who has been, I I would, (laughs) but who has seen, who has been on numerous shows uh, with Just for Laughs, one of the, probably the most iconic comedy shows here in Canada. Hey, I even want a Gemini, but I don't have it. It's in, Here's the deal. So they only give you two if you want a Gemini. What? So the producer and the other co-creator got the Geminis, and they told me I could get one, but I had to pay for it. And I said, I'm not paying for a fucking award. <laughs> <laughs> like, it just doesn't matter. And you know what? Um, so was this for American and Canada? American and Canada, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I didn't even go to the ceremony. <laughs> Because I was already fighting with the other producer, uh, the other creator, and uh, literally, I got from him. I told you you should show up. I knew we were going to win. I thought, man, we were up against twenty-two minutes at every crack. I didn't have any hope for, and I didn't, you know, I didn't want to go and sit there. All, I don't like award ceremony. I don't mind hosting them if somebody else is having one. But you wouldn't go sit down and... I've done it twice. I did it once. Uh, the uh, First, uh, Dave Kelly and I won um, Ampius for Best Television. That's a upper motion picture award. Motion picture and television award. Anyway, so I went to that one. And then we were presenting the next year. And I you went... one, I'm assuming? yeah. And then um, I wanted to <laughs> I wanted to drill holes in our ampias and wear them as necklaces, but Dave is a little more reverent than I am, so I thought that would be hilarious because it would look very pimpy. Exactly. Lock it up at this, <laughs> and uh, um, then I want another one, and I didn't go. I was doing stand up in Red Deer that night, and uh, the producer of the show calls me. And I'm like literally walking on stage. Um, and he said, you're not, you're not here and you won. I said, we'll go get it. And he goes, who should I thank? I said, well, thank you. You're the one that put the show together. I just hosted it. Like the hosts and, the, and comedians have the easiest part of the whole business. Like we just go do what we do really well that we love to do. And everybody else does the bullshit that makes it possible for us to do what we do. So really, we get the award, but we do like that much of the work. It's not even work. Do you classify it as work? Because that's probably one of the things what I do for a living, but I wouldn't say it was work. I love doing stand-up. It's the best. How... 
when I do something that I enjoy and I love, like you, like you and stand up, you get sort of endorphins in your head. And oh yeah, you enjoy it. I, I, I have to sort I'm of ready to go. So, <laughs> what have you been doing during this whole pandemic? Because everything so, is kind of you know, shut I down. Did some Zoom shows, and those those are brutal. Um, there and you know what? Even though, and I know people enjoyed it. And I know they needed the break, and they were all corporate stuff, so they were kinder, gentler, Jeb. You know, doing more family-oriented show, and uh, um, I, I'm I'm not big on those. And one guy actually told me, you, know, well, one of the guys we looked at his Zoom sales pitch, and he had set up a. A curtain and a mic and a lights and I was like, I'm gonna be sitting at my kitchen table. Like if you're if that's not okay with you, and literally it would be like me and you talking here. Only we're doing it on a Zoom. Yeah. We're doing it through the internet, and uh, they're okay. But you never you don't get the feedback, right? Like you can see a limited number of faces and. Do you do you feed off of that because I, oh yeah I hate the Zoom interviews via Skype or via for the podcast I just despise it with which passion. is why I came here instead of doing yeah I didn't want to do it that way so to be in front of an audience as a comedian you, you do uh, engage with them a little bit more and you feed off them oh I, I engage with them a lot. Oh, and I've seen your yeah, shows. I, oh, okay. So I talk to the audience a lot. I would, you know what? I have like probably four plus hours of material and I have heard it all. But if I can talk to the audience, I get to write new shit during the show and it makes me laugh. And it's more fun for me. It is more challenging. You can tell when guys have just a routine. I know a guy that, um, I'll have to think of his name. I haven't seen him in a million years. John Fox. I think it's John Fox. Uh, anyway, he had a bit that that it was a uh, required part of his bit that his alarm on his wristwatch went off. And he would set it every night and hit it right before he went on. And it literally, I watched him for like seven shows. It rang at the same word every show and I thought... Oh my God! Like you don't even. And he was He's a an autopilot. Yeah, but he was good enough at acting like it. You know, it's like he. Yeah, and. Um, so. I, I'm, I'm looking at the comedians of today, and I'm, I'm not. I'm a young buck. Don't get me wrong. I'm coming on forty here soon. I. It's sad that that's young to me. <laughs> <laughs> that is so sad. I. I I look at the comedians who are out there today, and I, I don't name names because I just I can't stand even to watch them for twenty minutes, let alone a whole set. I find that they are very regiment and very pandering. Yes, they are. Here we are. Here's I'm going to tell you the story about X, Y, and Z, and you know what it's going to be? It's going to be about Justin Trudeau. It's going to be about Donald Trump. It's going to be about X, yeah. Y, and Z. Looking back at your comedy, and this is this and I do stuff about I do stuff about Trudeau, but it's stories directly about Trudeau. Like when he was running for office, I ran into him at the um, where were we Delta Bow Valley Hotel because I was well. I can't remember if I was. Sta I think I was staying there at that time. It was a second divorce, but. Uh, and literally, it's a story that I actually had a chance to hold the elevator door for him, and I didn't. I pushed the closed doors. <laughs> I think you've just gained about... S smiling my ass off. <laughs> you've just gained about 10,000 conservative followers with that story. You know what, though? Like, how do you, Even if you're a liberal, I get it. Like, I'm a fiscal conservative, a social liberal. I don't care. Like, you do what you do. I don't... Uh, God bless you. Yeah. As I would prefer you not get tax money to do whatever it is you'd like to do. And uh, I don't think... I think this is how bad it is. I watched Trudeau giving a speech, and they were paying something. And he said, we decided as a government we should pay that. We're going to go ahead and pay that because it's unfair for the Canadian people to pay it. And I'm thinking, 
Where the fuck do you think the money comes from? Do you think, like, really, do you think it operates like a business? Which it does, but the widgets are us. Yeah. And he's actually dumb enough not to understand what a pathetic statement that was. Do you find that, and I love this conversation already because we're all over the place, but I love that type of conversation. Do you find that political comedy is sort of the go-to of today because uh, before the interview, anyone, for those who are watching and listening to this, before the interview, I asked Jeb uh, a question and it's going to come up here in a few seconds, but it's about the woke culture, about what's taboo about comedy. We we see... see know, what does woke stand for? I, I can't even keep up with all the acronyms that everybody puts on behavior. But are you not afraid that you might get canceled for saying something inappropriate? Because I cancel from what? I'm not on TV anymore. <laughs> I have my own podcast. I can do whatever I want on there. And that's why we're here. I can't, yeah. <laughs> and I can't get canceled from it. Well, I guess I could. The producers could just go, you know, that's about enough of that. <laughs> but um, you'll have to come on the show sometime. It, it, it's, a, it's a good, and it's the same. It's just a conversation, it's not a, a question answer. Um, but as far as see, I'm not about pleasing the the audience, and I will. I would rather challenge them and make them think. And uh, uh, there used to be this little club that, and I was doing a show there, and I was talking about um, the fact that they're they're putting um, what is fentanyl in into cocaine. And they're killing people with it. And I said, that's like the worst marketing plan in the history of the world. You're killing your customer. Like, you never buy a car. And then as you're walking out to the car, they sneak up and put a bullet in your head. Because you'll never come back and buy another car because you're dead. So to me, the stupidity of killing your clientele, it's like, that's bad drug business. Like, that's just, that's bad any business. But... Uh, and I'm in the food business. I know if I start killing my customers with my food, they're not going to come back. They will not be repeat customers. So that was the gist of it was it how illogical I found it that these guys would be putting that into a drug that at a point in my life I was amazingly fond of. And it, I mean, per Peruvian pink flake, you'd never see that. And I don't know what they put in it now other than fentanyl but they'll put anything in it as far as i can tell you open the subject so let's talk about it for a little bit here is sober not sane uh your podcast that you do host on youtube and facebook for anyone who's listening you know what i'm about to say links are in the show notes so if you're watching this via youtube scroll down and there it is and if you were listening to this go back on another page on spotify or apple podcast or wherever you get it and the links to jeb's uh so we're not saying uh podcast. and it's not totally about addiction like it's uh so we're not saying the name of it comes from a guy that I'd known a long time ago that was probably should have been less inclined to come and see me. And uh, he comes in. I'm like, well, I'm kind of surprised to see it. And he said, well, I heard you were sober. I wanted to see what that looked like. We talked for, I don't know, a half an hour or so. And he goes, you know, you're sober, but you're still fucking nuts. And I'm like, did you think it was my abuses that made me crazy or... Was it I did those things because I was crazy? Like, there, I mean, it's a coin flip, right? Comedians and uh, sobriety seem to be an issue. A, a issue plus all the rage now. It seems like everyone wants to get sober and go out on the trail and do some comedy. Do you kind of feel like you've paved the way because you... Oh, no. There there were people long before me. I'll tell you the funniest thing that happened. Sinbad was at, at the Blackfoot Inn, and I was opening for him. Oh, wow. And uh, so I did stuff about about being sober. And, uh, I mean, we know each other from before. <laughs> And he, he says, hey, come, ba come back here. And he make, makes me go back on stage with him. And he says, uh, why do you quit drinking? I said, yeah. And he said, and drugs? I said, yeah. And he goes, why would you do that? You were so fucking good at it. 
And then he kept trying to convince me to go back to it. I thought, you're such a dick. I mean, it was really funny. But I mean, who tries to talk someone to go back in. to go back into it? <laughs> I was really good at it, but what, what was till it owned me. Oh, it it owned me. Lost my second family, you know, marriage. Um, what was it? A wake up call? Like I remember when I, I I I don't want to say I've been sober for the entire time, but I remember that day. That day, that exact moment when I went, okay, I gotta stop drinking because if not, I'm not gonna move. Oh past. yeah, I'm not gonna become a. I was, I, I was like, my choice was, you gotta go to Betty Ford, or jump off the balcony. That's it. You're done with that. So you went to the Betty Ford Clinic. I, I remember you do, I, you do talk yeah. about it a little bit in your show, so we're not saying on YouTube, but. And I don't know. You know, they say it's the best place in the world to go get sober i don't know if that's totally true or i i had just been trying um i tried a lot of other things it wasn't certainly it wasn't my first rehab but maybe i was just ready then and i wasn't ready before like um within the the Alberta healthcare system, you can go to lander which is a really good program i wasn't ready to quit do you, do you mind me asking how long you've been sober? Uh, seven years at Easter. Oh, wow. It's a milestone. So there's definitely a second coming joke sitting in there. <laughs> I was about to say something. I was like, yeah, and I don't want to... the comedian do it. I don't want to offend the Christians, but I seem to. Uh, I, I just exist and I offend them. <laughs> yeah. That's a game. Yeah, that's... <laughs> As a, it, it's not that hard. And, you know, my, I, I remember my mom. And actually, I'll have to tell you, I have the best last words for, that I heard my mom say. But uh, she was endlessly disappointed with me. And uh, I heard this a lot. Oh, Jeb. And it was just like, you know, that's just going to make me go back to my dealer. That's not going to talk me into stopping you know it's just now I've disappointed you and that's another excuse to use and uh, so my mom is is out of hospital in the states and and I'm not able to get there to her my um, she was always about her car and basically I I said she can't drive anymore she's you know, she'd been in a couple of accidents and never got, they never took it away. They never, any, anyway. So, um, and she just wanted, she was in a care center at that time. And uh, she just wanted to go home. And I said, you can't go home. If you get better there, they're going to send you to a rehab. But don't worry, the other place is saving your room so you have your home to go to. And she says, uh, so you're telling me that I can't go home either? I said, yeah, I'm telling you you can't home. She goes, well, I guess I'm done talking to you. It's the last thing she ever said. Prophetic and correct. Okay. Um, kind of not, uh, not, not, not to try to one-up that story, but uh, when I got diagnosed with cancer, it was the, the day of my birthday, 2020. July 25th, 2020. On my birthday? On my birthday. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, fucking right it was. Um, we, we fly back. My husband and I fly back to Ontario because that's where my family's from. Okay. And we, I sit down with my father. I didn't tell him beforehand. I, we sit down, like, literally get off the plane, get to Newcastle, Ontario, sit down with him, and I go, I've been diagnosed with cancer. First thing he says to me is, are you sure? Tell me when it's actually true you have cancer. <laughs> yeah. Why? Was, that's a very expensive, shitty joke. <laughs> exactly. Like, why... <laughs> But that is that was our that was our conversation. So I and at that moment, that's when I go back to that comment about I make jokes about it. It's because the very first person I told after my husband was, yeah, he see, and not here's to talk about it until after. Here's and my mom was a, a born again evangelical right wing Christian. Oh, and she. This is my mom to a T. Um. She would probably say, well, God probably did that because he's gay. <laughs> like, seriously. Oh. And I, I would just go, how are you putting that? I had three friends die in a, a car wreck in high school. 
And she says, well, Jeb, it's God's will. Don't worry about it. I said, you mean God hated my three friends so much, he had them crash into a lake and die. I don't, do you have any idea what, what he, they did to God to make him so angry? Like, see, and I think, I believe there's some sort of entity up there, but I, I think he got the ball rolling and then he's been sitting around just looking at Earth going, look what you're doing. Had high hopes for you, but look what look what you've accomplished. Yeah, you. I but, sent you my kid. What did you do to him? You are not nice people. <sighs> we 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 joke about a lot of things with the rise of COVID nineteen and the rise of just just being able to laugh at things right now. Yeah. Are we getting back to a place in society where we can just? have a laugh with people and not have to be worried about oh you know god i hope so you know it's really i was doing a show in in uh <laughs> sorry go ahead because the reason i ask that is because I, I i try not to do a lot of research on my guests who come in because i want my my listeners to learn about them from you right from guests so i did research and i watched a clip of your one of your stand-up gigs where you talk about spanking your daughter Okay. If you remember that. Um, but you talk about how there are some parents who wouldn't want that. You have to have positive reinforcement and spanking your daughter. And I was watching that and I was like, if he would have said that in 2022, he would have had the Calgary Police Service at his door. Oh, I sure probably he... still would say that. <laughs> well, and that's the thing. But it's... I'm not talking about hurting a child. But spanking. Were you spanked? Yes. I was soaped in the mouth. I said the F word to my mother. I can't even say the F word. And you got soap in the mouth. Yes. <laughs> That's how fun my family was. Oh, my God. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15-second soundbite. Be sure to hit that subscribe button today to be kept in the loop of all the great episodes that are coming up on the show. Also, click on the links in the show notes and follow our social media pages as well. Yeah, I hope it didn't offend you. No, oh god, fuck. I, we, at our wedding, our wedding, we got the Jerry Falwells protesting our wedding. Actually coming out. Where? Glenbow Museum. July 28th, 2018. Gay, Jewish, Nicaraguan immigrant gets married to a gay, Jewish, or gay, atheist from Ontario who's an Alberta NDP cabinet minister. We oh were going to and Rachel Notley officiated our wedding. We had it coming. Oh my god. But yeah, you know, I, I I laugh at these things and my family, my friends have all told me you have a sixth sense of humor if you can laugh at trouble. But I'm like if you can't laugh at trouble, what the fuck can you laugh at? Yeah, you're only going to laugh at happy things? Exactly. Like, like what do you Clown. You need a clown. Yeah. And I... That puppy bit that little kid. Now, that's funny. Well, it's just it's not. It's <laughs> child abuse. And... Yeah, but if you punish the puppy, the puppy doesn't know. He's just being a puppy. And the kid was probably doing something he shouldn't have. And instead of correcting your child, you just let him go until they got bit. Natural selection. God bless it. Darwinism. <laughs> it will. It will come through in the end. I, I want to go back to the podcast here for a second. When did the idea come about, or did someone approach uh, you? About I was a guest on somebody else's podcast, and the guy that was producing it, Juan, uh, came to me and said, "How come you're not doing a podcast?" Everyone I said, "I don't know." Yeah. <laughs> I said, uh, I don't have time. And uh, he's going, no, you should do one, you know, because you were on TV and, you know, what you're doing. And it's and it's really funny. Every once in a while, he'll try to give me some direction. And I just stare at him until he goes, I'm sorry, I forgot. And, like, well, at least and he's a great guy. Like, he does, he does, he works really, really hard. And uh, as you know, it's not easy by any means it is not hard to find an audience it's it is but in your very first episode i i, I just recently re-listened to it because i am actually i i listen to it religiously now because i just listened to your one with uh 
uh, the soap lady. I forget her name right now. Oh, yeah. In my head. <laughs> Cancer. <laughs> um, but I listened Melba? to... Melva? Melva? Melva, M E L B. Melva, yeah, Melva. But I listened to your very first episode and. Oh, where was I? I fucking don't even know where I was going to fucking go with that now. That's your Do you know him, Kenneth? No, but. You guys, he's like really, really. I've known I've known him forever, and the best part was he told the story about how we met, and I had no recollection of meeting him. Like, oh. I mean, I knew that I knew him, yeah, but I didn't remember. I don't know how people do that. And the same thing happened with um, Andrew Schultz. He told this story about me walking into uh, Calgary Seven, and uh, I had really long shockingly white hair I was overly tanned because when it was hot I had suntan and I I literally would work the winter over the sun belt so I could stay tan which has been a bit of an issue <laughs> but uh, and he said you had a friend some guy came with you and then you had two huge diet cokes so I went huh don't remember that. Don't remember that. And I said, do you remember the my friend's name? And he said, no. He said, you don't? I said, no. I just don't, I don't remember it. I, as you were saying that, it clicked into my head when I, where, the, where I was going to go. Okay. You I was buying you time. Yes, there you go. That's <laughs> exactly what we're talking about. But in that first episode, you talked about the... I think it was the first episode. It might have been that. Anyway, um, finding the audience. Because the radio game has sort of changed. Television, as you know, has changed because people are oh, looking for... Time. We got rid of our cable. We don't have it anymore. Everything's streaming now. Everything's Spotify, yeah. Netflix, and all that shit. So the audiences for podcasts are there. It's, you have to find the niche, right? Yeah. And being who you are as sort of the... I'm going to blow smoke up your ass again, but... The celebrity who you are, the like a sort of icon in comedy in here in Alberta, but across Canada. Okay. <laughs> Again. Thank you. This is Chris Brown talking, and I, I'm kind of starstruck right now, so I do I, apologize. I'm not good at taking compliments because I'm just kind of like. So that's why you want me on your show. So. Oh, thank you. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. So, you, I'm assuming because your guests that you have on are so interesting. And you're able to have that open conversation that I, I tried to pride myself on, but you make it seem so easy. Why? Is yeah, but it's no, di it's no different than you sitting here talking to me. I mean, it's the same thing. And uh, the people that worked on, on the morning show, on the Big Breakfast, would always get mad because they're like... Oh, you asked the first question, and then you went in this totally different direction. But I, to me, your second question comes out of the first answer. Yeah. There's a natural progression. But if you're sitting there patiently waiting, like, stop talking so I can ask question two, wow. you're, you're an asshole. Well, as a former journalist, I hated that. Because my editor would send me with a list of questions that I had to ask. Oh, my God. And I would go, I can't. I cannot ask those questions because then I'm not listening to you. Because everybody that's watching the interview is thinking the same question you are. Oh, yeah. It's not like, no offense. We're not geniuses. It's it's a natural, ever, usually from the, the answer to your first question, there's a natural second question. And if you don't ask it, people at home are going... No, ask about, you know, he just mentioned wrestling a grizzly bear, and now you're, you know. Now you're talking about something completely different. Catching a trout. Like, who gives a shit? What about the bear? And actually, that happened to me once. It was something, about, I don't remember what it was, but something about a bear story. And I got so enthralled with the bear story, I totally blew off the rest of the interview and just talked to the guy about. But I... This so this is this is Chris Brown again talking, but because you're you're supposed to be the guest and you're supposed to be the one who's talking, but I, I feel like I'm answering some questions as well. My my show came out of the idea that we Twitter social media I hate it, despise it with a passion. That's how we connect. But I despise it with a passion. I get worn out, but exactly. We don't do this anymore. We don't have conversations. Yeah. And I feel like our society has crumbled because of it. Do you agree? 
Yeah, I, people of the the art of conversation is lost. Yes. And the one thing that amazes me, and this happened started years ago, and on the show we would get an unbelievable amount of emails. This is before the real social media took off. And uh, people would call and get angry because I hadn't answered their email. And I said, hold on, let me check something. And I would write down how many e emails I got every day. And I'd say, I got 125 emails yesterday. I answered the ones that I'm deemed really important, apparently. Yours was not very important. And people would get so angry. And somebody told me one time, half the people that watch you watch you because they're mad at you. I said, I don't give a shit. It's all ratings. <laughs> and it's but also, if you say something that that upsets people, it starts a conversation. Well, I'm just looking at the Dave Chappelle reference, right? Because he came in yeah. and said some transphobic things in a recent Netflix series. <laughs> And people were talking about Dave Chappelle, and they were talk listening to this. Do you really think they were transphobic, though, or were they more? <laughs> were they more about? He truly doesn't understand. I think it's a bit of both. And I, I think, think here's the here's the way I look at that, is if you I've known a couple of like more than a couple people that are transgender, and. Uh, Somebody said to me, I have so much empathy for them. And I said, no, you have sympathy. Unless you know what it's like to feel like you're trapped in some uh, body that you don't belong in, you have no fucking idea. You don't have, you can have sympathy, but not empathy. All the people that are transgender can be empathetic towards each other because they've been through it. And uh, one of the people that I know, that uh, did the full-blown change. Um, somebody was saying to me, and they're in the business, I won't mention who they are, but they were they were saying, I, you know, I don't know, you know, what if he's, if he doesn't, if it's not really what he wants, what if it, and I said, you know, by the time you're to the point he's at, you're fucking dedicated. When you're going in for surgery and going, uh, turn my genitalia inside out. Like you, you're committed. You, there. I can't imagine there being a doubt. Well, then you have you have, you have medical doctors you have to talk to. It's not like psychiatrists. Exactly. You, can't you have just to walk live. To AHS and say chop it or invert it. I've had enough of this penis. Exactly. You it's can, gotta go. They have a long like I. We just did a week of uh, with transgender Albertans, um, all from Calgary here. And they all said the same thing. It's not just a light switch on. Oh, no. Tomorrow we're completely different. It's a process, and it's not just a one-day process. But I, I don't even know. I can't even. I got a pretty good imagination. <laughs> but I cannot imagine feeling that I was in the wrong body. I can't. I... I, I just credit to them because they are willing to openly talk about it because we had great conversations. And the pain and suffering of not feeling the inside matches the outside was truly... Well, it would, it, it would just affect your entire life. Like everything you do, that would be in the back of your head all the time. But getting back to Dave Chappelle, PR, right? For comedy, sometimes if you push the envelope far enough... People are talking about you again because I don't remember. I don't people. honestly. I don't. I know enough about him that that would not be his intent. He literally does not give two fucks about what anybody thinks about him. Do you? Some people, the people that are personally important to me. Um, it, like Joe Blow off the side of the street, you wouldn't care. No. Yeah. And honestly, if I say something in a comedy show that you feel has affected you so badly, like you probably shouldn't have been at the comedy show. And I'm not really, I don't go totally over the top. I used to do 45 minutes about religion. Did, and I tried to offend them all equally, and uh, which is hard to do because they all have their own bizarre if you if you research enough about religion, almost every religion you'll read apart and go, huh? Funny how how 
How the fuck do you believe that? <laughs> How? Well, no, read it. Read it out loud and think, and then tell me that you're still okay with this. Can we both just agree, though, that Scientology takes the cake and it's just completely out the fucking left field? Well, loving- the amazing thing about Scientology is uh, <coughs> he announced what he was going to do. He said the real money is in coming up with a religion. That's where the cash flow is. And then he did it. He like basically said, look, I'm a really good writer. I might as well write something biblical-ish. And I don't know enough about Scientology, but they, they, like, uh, they take it way more seriously, although the Catholics take the cake. The, ca- the Catholics have, man, they have uh, made uh, decades and centuries of uh, trying to force their religion on others. And uh, I, I went to, I was in uh, Colombia, Cardenia, and they had, it was basically a museum of torture from the Crusades. And you, you watch this and look at all these things that they did to other human beings in the name of their religion. How can that be right? You know? And I mean, if you're a Catholic, I don't care. I, like, I know you're not going to be happy that I'm saying that. But, you know, I believe in God, as the old joke goes. I wish I could remember whose joke it is. You know, I'm okay with God. I don't like all the people that are working for him. And that's kind of the thing. And literally, biblically, if you followed the Ten Commandments, the, if everybody did that, that we wouldn't need all of that. We wouldn't need to go somewhere to be told what to do because we already know, hey, there, here's 10 things. And I used to say, you know, I told him at Betty Ford, I said, you know what's wrong with this, the AA system? Uh, you have 12 steps. God has 10. How can God have less fucking steps than you? Like it takes two more steps to get sober than it does to get to heaven. And literally, if, if I've never, never been to uh, the Betty Ford Clinic, but if it's like anything like AA, the first one is let God deal with it. And so you have, yeah. you have the 12, and then you have the fucking 10 as well. And it's a good kickstart. There's, if you look through, do you remember, um, we had a guy on that, that um, uh, Curtis, that was really big into um, smart recovery. A very pragmatic way to look at your recovery. Here's steps to take. Okay, you feel like drinking, read this sheet of shit you filled out that tells you why not to. And it it took me forever to find out. I went to a psychiatrist because I thought I was crazy. Like, I'm not stupid. How can I not stop doing this? And he said, you got, no, you got nothing to stop you. Like, there's nothing in your system that goes, hey, you should maybe not do that. Like, he said, you'll just do it till it kills you. And I was like, yeah, but why? You know, he said, understand that you're not controlling it. And I think that's the theory of that. And I was, I got bounced from AA to NA to CA when I was at Betty Ford. They kept bouncing me around trying to find a group that was easier for me to work with. But, um, you know, and I don't, I'm not saying anything bad about AA. It didn't work for me. It works for millions of people. And if that's what keeps you sober, God bless. I'm good with you going three times a day if you need to. And um, that whole, you know, let it go to God. To me, the whole thing just went to fucking let it go. Like not to, it didn't have to have a destination. Because in our family, the destination would be um, try to choke that down into your heart and hang on to it as long as you can. That's where we put it. And then we blow up. Um, I've gone through them all. I've gone through AAA yeah, 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 because that's what you think when you first assume that you are an alcoholic. You look for every option, right? And then you fall off the wagon like I didn't. Not everyone does, and please say, for anyone who's about to send me negative press or negative emails, please do, and I'll file, file them away in the appropriate location. Everybody that stops relapses. Exactly. Everybody. So I had to look at it from a different perspective, right? And then I had to find what worked for me. Find what speaks to you. Exactly. So 
you, 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 you've been open about your time in Betty Ford and going to Betty Ford. Yeah, and it's a lot. It's a lot more than just. It's an AA based, but there's a lot more going on there than just following the big book. Do you think you could have done the rehab part, get sober, if you stayed up here in Canada? Because um, Betty Ford is not a. It's not, thing. No, it's not a cheap venture. Exactly. Uh, a couple of the ones, I've talked to friends that have gone to other ones, and he, one of them said, have you looked them up online? Do they have horseback riding? Because my place I'm going to has horseback riding. I'm like, I just want to stop drinking and doing drugs. I don't, I don't need a... I don't need a massage. I don't need a back. I don't need, you know, I need somebody to go try these things and see if it'll. And it's a uh, an accumulative thing I find that will keep you sober. Seven years sober. Yeah. Still have days where you potentially would want to. Go oh, I'd rather be high. <laughs> okay. <laughs> True. I'd rather, and you know, honestly though, if I start again, it'll kill me. Do you honestly think that? Oh yeah. Because at that time you just say, fuck it. Balls out. I don't do anything halfway. <laughs> Never have. You, you've joked about a lot of things in the last hour or 15 minutes that we've been recording this. I, I, I want to ask, because you were the first comedian that I want to ask this to, because it seems like you're being open and honest about a lot of things. Is there anything off limit? Is there anything that you would say, okay, I can't joke about that, because even for me, that's pushing the envelope a little too far? Well, not... <clears throat> it's the way you construct it. I had, some, I had somebody tell me, um, you can't do a rape joke. So I have a very... It's an old joke that I used to do that is very pointed, and it's, um, it's not... Per se, it's a perspective joke. It's not a. It's not making fun of rape by any means. And you could always bait somebody, some guy in the audience. You know, do, do you think no means no all the time? Like when a woman says no, does she? You know, she's serious or, you know. And you'd always get some idiot like, how can you not know this truck's gonna hit you? And there would always be some guy. No, they just say that and then. You know, and I said, okay. And at that time, Mike Tyson was in prison. I said, okay, let's say you're in prison with Mike Tyson. He's got you bent over the sink there. Now, if you say no, do you mean it? Or are you just... Just saying. Do you playing along? And uh, the point is, trying to give an understanding of no means no. It wasn't a joke about rape. It was, look at what you're saying and thinking and the fact is, if somebody says no, they don't want to have sex with you, they don't want to have sex with you, and you need to respect that. Yeah. But this this is going to get me into trouble, and I'm going to... Yay. Yeah, the <laughs> post gets into trouble. All my listeners in Australia and Germany, for some reason, will enjoy this comment. We... We live in a world now, and I would say since the rise of a certain president down south, that it's the me first. It's, we got to do things for what's good for me and screw everyone else. And yeah. if you don't like it, if you don't want it, I don't care because I'm going to get it. Does that hurt in comedy when you are trying to... Well, no, blind? because the people that, that believe that yeah. are, are easy to make fun of. Yes, that's true. Because they really, they think, and here's here's the thing about people. They have a really short memory span. Um, you know why most movies are an hour and a half to two hours tops? Because that is max attention span for the general public. I mean, it's very designed, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. When I, when I do stand-up, if I'm doing a, a full show, I actually... And if you if you watch, I'll I'll get you tickets to the show the third through the fifth. You guys should come, but um, there will be a point in that show where I slow down a little bit and then start them back up because it works better. So there's people's attention span very very low. 
So, when was the last time you heard anything said about Black Lives Matter? The only reason I can say this is because I literally just had someone from Black Lives Matter on the show a month and a half ago, so... November. Yeah, but it's almost gone by the wayside. And is it is it true that uh, it's fixed? No. <laughs> okay. Is it true... Is it true that black lives don't matter now so we can ignore it? Like, what's the truth? Well, the truth of it is every life on the planet matters. And um, the problem is, and I always love everybody that's against black lives matter when they're talking about the police and the states killing uh, black people. This is their comeback. Well, you know, it is an actual statistic that the police kill more white people than black people. And I said, isn't the problem they're killing people? Isn't there like, isn't there a slightly bigger picture than, you know, do brown lives not matter? Do, do like, the police are killing people. And I think part of the reason in the States is the police are petrified of the public. I, <laughs> you've opened up a can of worms that I'm so passionate about that I want to just uh, to get your opinion. Sure. We live in a society that we have the 15 second memory, right? Yeah. We, we talk about you not remembering stories of guests of, that have come on your show. Yeah. I can't remember names half the time. Seems like people on Twitter get their passion project for 15 seconds and it's gone. The only reason I say this is because it's happening here in Calgary. Uh, we currently have a counselor here in the city of Calgary, Sean Chu, who was accused of uh, uh, assaulting a 16-year-old girl. We're all against it. We think he should resign. I'm just going to... We, we are against that actual activity. Exactly. Okay. Yes. I completely So agree. far, we're getting along fine. Agree. My concern is... What about Justin Trudeau, who did the exact same thing to a reporter in B.C. while he was a teacher... Same thing. But he we, should resign. He should, but this is my concern with the left and right politics here. And this is why he I showed up in blackface more than once for Christ. <laughs> and you know, if nothing else, <laughs> okay, it tells you that he's stupid. Yep. Because his dad was running the country and he thought no one would notice. Or he thought it was okay. Like, no matter what scenario you work out that that uh, uh, for lack of a better term, justifies him getting into blackface. Um, it was shit judgment. Yeah. And he got elected, and this is my favorite line, the, Canada elected not only a drama teacher, but a fucking substitute drama. He wasn't even a full-time drama student or teacher. And yeah, if he did assault someone, he should resign. Exactly, but the left seems to forget anything that the left does, right? The we, in the twenty nineteen election, those blackface photos came out. Yeah, Andrew Shear, like two days after the blackface photos, the leader of the Conservative Party yeah, at yeah. the time said, "I'm half American." People were more offended by the fact that he was half American than Justin Trudeau doing blackface, and I'm not like. Excusing anything. Yeah. Like, when, did, when did we take more offense to the fact that people are half American, being yourself, yeah. than someone doing blackface? I just couldn't understand. The or concept. assaulting someone. Exactly. Or whatever you pick, where you're going. It's we have uh, the left, and I say that kindly, and I know I will never be able to run for politics ever again after, with all the shit that I've said on this show. But we put blinders up. When it comes to certain people and not others. Yeah. And it pisses me off. Yeah, and it should. Yeah. It should. No one should be able to get away with that shit. Trump assaulted women. Yeah. He admitted it. They have it on tape. Yeah. He talks about doing it. And yet, he's pre he was president. Joe Biden, exact same thing. He sniffs people on all the time. He's president now. That might just be one of the weirdest... <laughs> I never touch her. I, I was downwind. <laughs> I got a good whiff of her perfume. Like, that's just, holy crap. I, uh, I... But you know what amazes me is people will go online and believe anything they re read on the Internet. And uh, somebody, somebody brought, because I'm divorced, I have um, no interest 
in another relationship, marriage. Really? I'm really happy being left alone. And uh, still really good friends with my ex-wife, as far as I know. The first one, not so much. She's still, she's, she fucking hates me still. Is this the one from Edmonton? No, from uh, uh, the States, oh, okay. from Idaho. So, but I think my second ex-wife is smart enough to know that it's torturous to her to just spend her time hating me. It's a horrible way to, and did I do horrible things? Yes, I did. And um, I can't take them back. I can't make up for them. And, you know, she is still very kind to me, which is great. And I try to help her if I can, although I'm not that much help. But um, I don't know how people can go on the, anyway. Okay, so the story was this lady brought another lady in to meet me. And she's half snapped from the night before. And she left. I said to the other woman, she's drunk. And she goes, yeah, and you're an alcoholic. I thought you guys would get along. The fuck? It's the most idiotic mentality. She was trying to help. <laughs> she was. But she had looked up online and saw online somewhere she found... It said that I was worth three to five million dollars, which I am not. I don't mean to let the cat out of the bag. I took my bottles back for gas money to get here. It's going, you know what? It's, um, I've had an excellent time in my life. I have not always been smart with money. I have not, but I've got my business now. I've got the, the at the crossroads, I sell pasta and sauces and that stuff and you know, support myself everything's fine but i don't bemoan what i did you know i feel sometimes feel kind of bad about what i did to my body and how how the the things that i did affected the people that loved me i feel bad for having done that but i can't fix it the future what does the future look for jet i have no idea I don't, and here's the weird, I've never overly planned my life. Really? Yeah, you know what, you know how I got into comedy? There was a guy, I was running a, like a Jiffy Stop gas station, you know, a little store, gas bar, you know? And uh, this guy came in, and uh, in the midst of talking to him, he was a regular, he was a good guy, he delivered these little, Newspaper things, and uh, I don't. I don't know. I, I took a not a liking to someone that was uh, getting ready to pump gas, so I kept turning the pump on and off on him. And uh, he would come in and go, "What the fuck?" And he's like really angry. I go, "It's on. I don't know. I don't know what you're doing out there, but it's turned on." And then he would leave, and I would turn it off as soon as he tried to pump gas. And then uh, funny comes in, he's just losing. I go, oh, God. and I said to this guy, can you watch the store for a minute? I got a, I think the guy probably had a really nice car and it pissed me off. But I, so I go out and pump the gas. I go, there you go. And he's just, this is bullshit. And he's going crazy. And this guy said, you know, uh, I got some friends that are starting a comedy competition. This was in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and it's in Spokane, this comedy competition. He said, you should go into it. And I went, ah, that'd be fun. And so I did it. And then instantly fell in love with being on stage. And uh, I even like bombing. Really? Like I even found that amusing. I find it really amusing if it happens now because I should be well past that. Like, and but it still does every once in a while. But I'm, one of my really good outs is I'll look at an audience and go, you know, it's it's okay. Like I, I don't like you either. And I said, here's the bad part for you. I'm really, really good at this. And by the end of it, you'll be liking me and just hating yourself for it. Just kicking yourself going, I can't believe I'm laughing at this prick. Do you look back at your old material and reminisce about what you've done and where you've come from? No, or? you know, it's okay. Two things. Number one, some of the other comics that were up and coming when 
I was up here working that worked with me will tell me about bits that I used to do. And I ask them to write them down so I can kind of remember. I have everything on tape, but I don't watch tape of myself. But why not? Well, I, I was like there. You, you always. <laughs> but if you can't remember. But a show. Here's a show. You do the show. Uh, if you're doing your job properly, everybody had the time of their life. They had a great time. They had a little bit to eat. They had some cocktails. They're going to go home. And it was an hour that they didn't have to think about the shit in their life. And you gave them that hour-long relief. And in return, I got to entertain people that were laughing at things that I said. So that's my reward. So everybody got something out of it. And... Uh, to go back and, and look at a tape of that happening is just, it amazes me when people sit with their phone and record me. And it's like, just watch the show. Just be in the now. And that's what all of that social media shit has done. Nobody's in the now anymore. They're in the, hold on just a sec. Hold on just a sec. Hold on a sec while I record this and not remember what actually happened. Yeah, or never at. watch it. So why did you? You, you didn't enjoy... It's funny, I got in the elevator at this other building I was living in, down at the London Towers, and there's a um, really nice-looking young lady gets on, and she's on her phone. A really good-looking guy gets on, and he's on his phone. And we get to my floor, and I hold the elevator, and I turn around, and I said, if you guys would put your fucking phones down, you might meet each other. You'd make a nice couple. And they both did this. <laughs> and we're just... We are so self-involved that oh, yeah. it scares me that I can imagine we were self-involved prior to the pandemic. The pandemic has made us more self-involved that yeah. we are going to raise a group of uh, a, a society that won't do this anymore. We'd rather yeah. put a 15 second TikTok or fucking Zimbabwe or whatever you want to call it onto fucking social media because... I want to get 9,000 likes instead of actually having an actual... Yeah, site. see, right now I'm getting uh, two things I get on the on Instagram. Our guys trying to convince me that I should be into Bitcoin. And not just any Bitcoin, their Bitcoin, which is their con artists in general. And then um, I'm not even going to say that it's younger women that are sending me posts. For all I know, it's a guy that pirated a picture of a younger woman. And I spend some of my time, I've gotten pretty good at being able to tell uh, the young women that are looking for somebody to send them, you know, all of a sudden it's, you know, my car is broken down. And uh, I will occasionally write back, what a fucking shame, and then delete them. <laughs> I get those messages, too, from women saying, hey, come look at this random photo just for you. And I'm like, yes, you haven't read the profile where it says I'm a homosexual, but thanks. Greatly appreciate it. Oh, no, I got the answer for you. That's great. Do you have any pictures of your brother? <laughs> like, just double insult them. Not only am I not interested in you, I would rather look at a picture of your brother. <laughs> I, I, I should. It's either the women... Although you're married, so you have to be faithful. There you go. It's either the uh, women who are talking to me or people saying, I can promote your Instagram for $25 and get thousands of likes for you. Yeah. And then you go into their profile and they have like 10 followers. <laughs> Can't you do that for yourself first? Yeah, I wouldn't you? <laughs> good starting point i'm not telling you how to run your business but become popular first yeah um jeb i want to thank you for doing this oh thanks for inviting me I, I, I like and you know what i like talking to people directly so that's why i didn't want to do a zoom one with you and i wanted to actually meet you and oh, and we'll have to have you on our show i certainly will um before we do go february 3rd 4th and 5th Yes. At the... Blackfoot Inn, the laugh shop here in Calgary. Calgary. Okay. This is coming out the 1st of February. Yeah. So... And if you're in Australia, uh, it's a big flight and there's a lot of quarantining. 
So you better get on it. Exactly. If you leave right now, if you <laughs> and if you're a truck driver, don't go to the states. Like wait till after well, they're the all fifth. In Ottawa. <laughs> they're all in well, Ottawa. they're on. They're on their way there. I don't. We want to get canceled? In I predict the entire Trudeau reaction to uh, them landing in Ottawa is uh, him going, look at all the trucks. <laughs> big, big trucks, big trucks, big, big. The red one, the green one. Yeah. I, That's my favorite. I get it. I know, you know, they're as frustrated as anybody. I know why they're upset. Oh, and you know what, being a guy that's at the end of the rope on that, uh, the food chain for getting product here, like we're doing without a lot of stuff. I don't know what the answer is. I understand your frustration. We didn't even mention that. So I'm going to ask you that before we do go. What? They can meet you at the Crossroads as well. Oh, yeah. Crossroads Market. Yeah. So what do you, what do you sell there? I sell uh, pot, fresh pasta. I'll be making the pasta. Well, and here's where that trucker thing comes in. If I can find flour in the next two days, I'll have fresh pasta for the weekend. Otherwise, there'll be lasagnas, shepherd's pies, um, sell sauce? all the sauces. Yeah, and barbecue sauce. I do barbecue sauce. I will have to get my husband to take me to Crossroads because I'm 90% sure I've never been. Literally, I moved here when we were in the pandemic, so <laughs> I had to walk. You've been nowhere. Yeah, I've been here to the Tom Baker. I know the Tom Baker and the nurses and the doctors at the Tom Baker yeah. quite well. Thank you very much. Yeah, see, and I'm more of a frequent flyer at um, Rocky View or Sheldon Schumer, <laughs> which is the downtown... We should take him there, spot. <laughs> Let's go have fun. Yeah, that's, they're getting over it now. I show up and they're, they actually... Oh, hi, Jeb. Welcome back. Well, some of them will... The last time I was there was I had that jaw thing on the go, and the um, uh, some of the nurses came down, and they all, you know, they chat for a second, and they just go, are you sober? And I'd say, yeah, and they were great. That's awesome. So. Nice people. <laughs> Well, uh, I'm about to do my exit, and as you are well aware, um, for everyone here at the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown, uh, I want to thank you for tuning in. If you want to follow Jeb, please click on the links below. His podcast is there as well. Uh, links to his t uh, show for the second, the third, fourth, and fifth at the Black Blackfoot Inn. Blackfoot the Inn, shop. Uh, the Laugh Shop will be in the links below as well. Be sure to check it out, buy a ticket, go out and have a great weekend. I'm assuming it will be, you'll have to scan your QR code or whatever, but just enjoy yourself. And remember everyone here at the Crossword Entry Podcast, have yourself an excellent day. Keep talking, guys.